people to look at a background, but I don't have to do that tonight because I think most of you know Don. And the only thing I can say is that we have the special advantage, I guess, and privilege of having a lawyer who is still employed and working. <laughs> uh, we may have others in the subdivision, subdivision, but in the community who may be lawyers but retired. But uh, Don is still available um, for practice. And so, without further ado, let me introduce Don Humphrey. Thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> uh, yeah, you all, you all know me. I, I know most of you, and uh, I hope we can just keep this uh, informal tonight. Feel free to raise a question, uh, raise your hand if you have questions as we go along. Or, <coughs> and uh, and just pipe up uh, if I don't uh, don't don't call on you in time. As I was preparing for this talk uh, beginning about uh, a month or so ago, I uh, was um, just browsing the, the internet looking for you know, things that would uh, ought to be on uh, a, a list of the most important documents to have available, not just necessarily for your survivors, but for those who. You know, uh, while you are still alive, uh, while uh, family members may need to access things. And uh, I ran across an interesting article in the New York Times that was a little bit different. Instead of the documents and things that you need to have together, it's the things that we need to uh, think about cleaning out and getting rid of. And the, the title of this article was The Sex Toys in the Attic. <laughs> and I'm not gonna, it was written by a, written by a woman who uh, was uh, an aging baby boomer. I just I thought there's a, a funny uh, paragraph I might uh, read to you uh, uh, real quick. I know no one likes to think about death, but just as the responsible person designates someone to make medical decisions in case he or she is incapacitated. We should all have designated, let's call them eradicators, someone to come over and clean the house after we expire. Remember Marilyn Monroe? Not that I can prove anything, just saying. Your eradicator should be given house keys, a list of items to be destroyed in their hiding places. You don't want them to be, you don't want to be in intensive care screaming, back of the sock drawer. <laughs> the doctors will just increase your meds. <laughs> You can look at that article online if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, some of these uh, documents may be you know, fairly straightforward and obvious. Others may not. A lot of them may fall into similar categories. I thought I'd just make a few comments about each one of them. Um, first, uh, the first document we need to have available uh, is, is, of course, a will or if you prefer to use uh, use a trust uh, as a vehicle to pass property on to your survivors, um, then a, a, your reputable trust documents. Um, it's surprising, really, how many people still, uh, at our ages, don't have wills. I just met today with a young couple who uh, was down in Alaska, well, the, 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 the couple uh, grew up in Henry County, but he was stationed in, uh, at, uh, at Wainwright uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, and his father had just passed away 65 and uh, didn't have a will and things were, were quite, quite a mess. Um, but uh, one way or another, you are gonna have a will. It might be something that's written out on a piece of paper that's been properly signed, uh, witnessed, notarized, and so forth. But if you don't have that, then the state of Georgia's gonna write one for you. And it's, you'll find it written in the official Georgia Code annotated chapter or title 53. Um, and it will leave your assets uh, the way that the state thinks best. And <clears throat> that may not necessarily uh, concur with, with your thoughts. So uh, if you haven't done so already, please give serious consideration to uh, updating your will. If you'd like me to eyeball your will, uh, 
if you move your grass from another state and you're wondering whether it's George compliant, I'm happy to do that for free. And uh, now if you want a written opinion that your, <laughs> your beneficiaries could later on sue me for if in case I was wrong, and if I gave an opinion that yes, your will doesn't need to be changed, uh, if your New York will uh, uh, will be admitted to uh, probate by a Georgia court, that sort of thing. I might charge you a little bit for that uh, type of insurance policy, but I can tell pretty quickly just with, with an eyeball scan whether I think you need any assistance or redrafting uh, or uh, changes in any way to your will. And uh, trust me when I say uh, I've probably met more people who have not needed a, in my opinion, a change to their will than I have. So uh, I just want to make sure everybody feels comfortable with what they have. And if I can be of any assistance in that regard, just let me know and I'll be glad to drop by the house and, 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 and take a look at it for you. Um, like I said, uh, some people prefer to pass on their estate uh, using the vehicle of a reputable family trust. Personally, uh, I, I think there's a whole lot of benefits to, to doing that. Um, it avoids the hassle of probate, and I think it really is when we talk about being kind to your survivors, I do think it is one of the nicest things that you can do for your survivors is, is to get them all set up uh, with your property. That is the property that we have to do probate using a will um, to have all that held by you in the capacity as, as a trustee of a, of a reputable trust. And you and your spouse, or you, uh, if, if you're single, it, it can be you alone, uh, but you basically designate as the successor trustee after the second of, of a couple passing away, or if you're single after you pass away, you designate as a successor trustee, the same person who would be your executor of your estate. But that way, it seamlessly, uh, that person seamlessly takes over in terms of uh, the ability to own and deal with your property, and uh, he or she can simply uh, uh, sell the house, keep the house, convey it according to however you specify in the trust, and, uh, and then uh, divvy up the proceeds and uh, convey them out as you wish. And, and typically with the radical trust, all you're really talking about doing is putting your house and your vehicles and your personal property in, into the trust and then specifying in that document the same way you would in the will, how you want your property to, to pass. And uh, it takes a little bit more documentation at the front end, uh, but it is, uh, uh, that is more documentation than simply doing a will what you're really doing uh, when you put everything into a trust and then avoid probate. That's a big advantage of the trust is you avoid probate. Um, what you're doing is, is, in essence, you're probating your estate while you're alive. And uh, you, uh, it, it does require a little bit more documentation and, and there's a little bit more money up, uh, up front, but between the preparation of a will and then hiring a lawyer to to probate that will, it's a whole heck of a lot uh, less expensive. So uh, if you've given uh, any thoughts to, to a trust, uh, and you have any questions about that, uh, let me know. Uh, a letter of instruction, you could find a, a, a decent picture of that, but you can just imagine a letter of instruction. It can be a, a handwritten, typed out, uh, any sort of uh, correspondence that you'd like to prepare that essentially uh, uh, provides instructions to your survivors on how you want certain things to be handled. Um, it's, it may not be terribly practical to specify in your will how you want your, uh, whether you want a, a burial or, or cremation or what exactly you, you'd like to have happen uh, if you would prefer to be buried because um, that funeral is going to happen a, probably a lot more, a lot sooner and more quickly than somebody who uh, tries to find the will and opens it and, and reads it and so forth and, and tries to discern your wishes from 
whatever you've expressed in your will. So a letter of instruction that does that in terms of what you want uh, done in way of, of you know, final disposition of your body, and, you know, down to how you want your funeral arrangements made, and uh, that sort of thing. You can even you know, specify how you want specific pieces of personal property to, to go if you haven't done that in your will. Again, it's not legally binding, but it's, again, it's one of these nice things to do for your survivors. So if there's no doubt, and, and it can uh, basically serve to uh, uh, resolve any differences between you know, any of these survivors in terms of who gets what, that sort of thing. Um, a financial power of attorney, now this is a document that actually you should have available and have prepared uh, while you're alive because it expires upon your death. It is it loses legal effectiveness uh, upon your death. And in Georgia, uh, there's a there's a statutory form. Uh, you can basically almost use any kind of a form uh, that you want as long as it's uh, 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 notarized and it uh, you know is specific enough. But you appoint Typically, you know, spouses appoint each other as powers of attorney uh, for each other, uh, or you might appoint, you know, one of your adult children or your brother or sister or whoever is your, you know, your most trusted uh, uh, person in your life uh, to take over and, and uh, be available to handle your financial affairs should you become incapacitated. Um, and the the financial power of attorney, the statutory form Georgia uses, not only requires that it be signed, uh, and it's a good idea to have a witness. I typically have two witnesses uh, sign off on the power of attorney and typically try to have this done at the same time that you're signing your will or trust or all your, your related documents. But um, the statutory form also requires that you initial after each of the paragraphs that cover a different specific subject matter, such as you're appointing this person to be your agent for uh, financial, for, for banks, accounts, and, and uh, you're appointing that person to be your agent for real estate transactions, and maybe for legal proceedings, that sort of thing. If you don't initial after those paragraphs, guess what? Under the form, if you use that form, you haven't actually conveyed that authority. And this, that, this is, uh, reminds me of the danger of using online services such as uh, Rocket Lawyer or LegalZoom, that kind of thing, to, to prepare important end of life uh, and, and other you know, legal uh, documents. I, I'm like everybody else, I want to save money when it comes to um, taking care of things and and you know, goodness knows I wouldn't want to spend more money on a lawyer than I absolutely had to. But I will tell you that in my experience, when I run, run across uh, documents that a lot of people, including many in this community, have downloaded and, and tried to handle for themselves off of uh, an online service like LegalZoom, in many instances, they haven't actually they haven't got it done right. A, a, uh, a, a uh, wife, uh, uh, a husband uh, in, in one of our pods here, wasn't all that terribly interested in taking care of the paperwork. And, and that's what I sort of found among couples is that uh, the, the ladies are, are far more interested in securing that, the, the future and getting everything nailed down. And so she was particularly concerned about having the power of attorney. She downloaded it off of LegalZoom and and uh, this is like way well over a year ago, he even went to the trouble, she couldn't find a, a no republic anywhere in the community closer than somewhere in Clayton County. So she drove up to Clayton County with the power of attorney and, and signed off on it, but she hadn't initialed any of, of these paragraphs. And the, even though the instructions that Peter <coughs> told her to, that she needed to initial that, what she had actually done is, is gone to a whole lot of, <coughs> lot of trouble and made uh, legal zoom about $75 or whatever, and she didn't really have an effective power of attorney. And so, um, you know, I, I felt like, you know, what I could have done for her for, you know, my fee for the simple power of attorney is $45. And uh, it wouldn't 
have been it would have been effective and uh, the mistakes would not have been made. So I, I just I just throw that out there as a word of caution. Um, just just uh, be sure that if you download any of those forms, like the, typically the instructions are fairly clear, but sometimes they can be they can be confusing. Um, so that's uh, on the power of attorney. And like I said, it, it does expire upon death. So what you want to do is also, as, as far as, as bank accounts, you, you it would be useful and, and, and wise to have somebody set up, not necessarily named on the account, but at least with signing authority, such as the executor of your will, so that the executor can access that, that bank account uh, immediately uh, if, um, if you know, it's not a typical situation of a joint account with, 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 uh, with spouses, but have, have somebody else, an adult child or somebody, with signing authority on, on that account um, to, you know, to, to, and maybe an account that perhaps it's limited in, in terms of the amount it has in it, uh, you know, just to, enough to cover uh, aerial expenses and, 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 and that kind of, kind of thing. But uh, think about having having that already pre planned and set up. Is there a question back here? Are you a notary public? I am. I'm a notary public. And I, I have uh, come to find out that I, I may be the only one in the community. Um, so the, there used to be a, a two, two of the ladies down at the sales center used to be notaries, but I think, number one, they, they let their commissions expire and haven't gotten around to renewing them. And then, Number two, they, they both may now no longer work for, for full team sales. So I'm going to get my wife, Gail, to also get a notary commission so that we can you know, assist the community and there's certainly no charge for that sort of thing. The difficulty is, is that uh, a lot of times I'm, uh, I'm not always around when, when people immediately need them. I got a call back to last week at uh, 9.30 asking well, the call came in. I didn't see the call. I didn't see it until the next morning. But uh, the uh, the adult child of, of one of uh, the, the residents here was uh, needing to have some documents notarized, and they wanted they would they would gladly come over to the house had I been available. Um, and then I didn't even hear the message until like eight o'clock the next morning. By that time, I was in Atlanta. So I mean, those sort of things happen and they had wind up going down to a bank and finding a notary and that's where you find uh, other notaries I think nearer than Clayton County like this, like this uh, uh, other lady did uh, but that's where you typically find uh, notary publics and, uh, uh, and, and there's not don't go to the courthouse looking for one either because there's really not any at, at the courthouse or at least none that will publicize that or, 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 or offer their assistance they, have gotten to the point where, uh, for some reason, they've been very reluctant to serve as, as notaries. In the county annex, if any of you have been to the property tax assessor's office in the annex, across the street from the courthouse, when you open the door on, on the left, the, there's an administration office, and there's a notary public in there, too. But basically, thanks for your best bet. But please feel free to, to uh, give me a call. And, and as long as I, you know, you can get my attention. I can't. I hear the phone and I answer it and so mm -hmm. forth. I, I stay up pretty late and I get up pretty early, so I'll be, I'll be glad to assist. Um, let's see. Another document that we all need to have is what George calls an advanced directive for health care. Other states call it a living will. Um, I found that especially those who have moved here from other states typically come here with two documents uh, that Georgia combines into one document if you use the statutory form. The two documents a lot of states use are one called, it's, it's called a uh, directive for health care that, that specifies, you know, who, uh, or your durable uh, uh, attorney, health care agent is, is what that specifies. That's more like a health care directive. Uh, and then there's the a separate document called the living will, where you specify uh, your wishes in terms of having having the plug pulled on you if you're in a permanent state of unconsciousness, or as Georgia puts it, if you're in a uh, 
terminal condition with a very uh, short amount of time expected to, to live. And, and you know, and, and, there, and two medical doctors are certified, one of whom is not a treating physician, have certified that uh, you know, it's pretty hopeless and we don't inspire it in a fairly short amount of time. That's, that's the, the so-called living will. And uh, uh, Georgia has combined it into two, those two forms that other states use into one form. And my advice to, to those who, who move here with, and they're in that situation with two documents is to seriously consider about putting, uh, signing uh, a new Georgia compliant advanced Healthcare director, and here's here's the reason. What you don't want to to put your medical providers in because this document is only for the medical providers. It's not really for you. I mean, you express your wishes, you have it witnessed, um, and, and it doesn't have to be notarized. But I, I think it's it, it's safer to notarize it, so that's what what I do. Um, but what you want to do is have this. And you can make as many copies as you want. Medical providers are authorized to work off of copies. They don't have to be originals. So uh, I think that the prudent thing to do is to sign a Georgia compliant, use a Georgia form, and sign that instead of using the documents that you may have had done in another state because the doctors the medical providers may be confused, frankly, by your uh, New York uh, or your Tennessee uh, documents and the last thing you want them feel like they need to do is sending it off to the legal department to find out what the parameters and, uh, and the limits on their authority to act may be whereas if you uh, give them your advanced directive for health care, the George compliant one uh, in advance of any, any treatment and they have that in their file, they, they're, they're familiar with that, they, they recognize it, and there's not going to be any gap in terms of uh, what they know they can and, and can't do. They're familiar with this document, and it's basically just to make life a lot more convenient and easy for the medical providers. What is the name of the Georgia form? Is it one or are there several? There's just one form, and it's called the Georgia Advanced Directive for Health. Just like in the title of the slide, the Advanced Directive for Healthcare. So you can you can look that up online and um, and use it, um, and, and you'll see how you make your wishes known by initial initially or in some instances not initially, as the case may be in the form. Um, <coughs> next next item uh, are deeds. I thought this was an interesting deed, a land deed to Antarctica. In February of 2009. So, anyway, uh, you ought to have your your uh, property deeds, your or any real estate that you own, your house, any you know, unimproved land, uh, second homes, that kind of thing, your cemetery lots. Have all that available, obviously. Um, here's something: um, uh, evidence of loans made and, and, and debts owed. I guess I, I may have missed or skipped one. But um, I mean, whether, whether it's evidence, written evidence that is as, uh, as primitive as this particular slide may indicate, uh, or something uh, you know, more formal, if, if you have money owed to you, uh, <coughs> uh, and especially if the executor of the state's gonna need that. Uh, if, if you, obviously, if you have debts that you're, you're still obligated for and you're, you're paying on, you ought to have that uh, already all listed out uh, with uh, names, addresses, contacts, the account numbers, um, all, all that kind of stuff to uh, so that your executor again can pick up and then seamlessly take over or at least you know, the executor or those assisting uh, the, the executor of your estate or your surviving spouse. Don't leave people uh, wondering what uh, what's owed and what's not, uh, what needs to be taken care of, uh, what's at risk of being seized by a creditor because uh, the, the, the mere fact that you no longer 
uh, walking this earth is not going to necessarily make a difference to whether the creditor is going to move against any collateral if uh, it is the, if, if there are assets of yours that are used as collateral to secure repayment of, of a debt. If you have all vehicle titles, I'd have them all, all together. You might even have the back of them signed to uh, uh, sign in blank so that if, if your um, uh, the executor wants to simply transfer it to himself or herself, uh, that, that can be done. Um, uh, or we'll sell it. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me. When it comes to vehicles, Georgia does have a, a form and format where uh, an, a vehicle can be retitled to, uh, to a third person via the executor of a will without actually formally open probate. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Say you've got, say you've got a replica trust and everything's in the trust, but you bought this, uh, uh, bought a new vehicle or a used vehicle, but you got a vehicle that wasn't retitled into the trust, and now you got to uh, <coughs> consider, do I have to open up a probate proceeding simply to convey title to this vehicle? When it comes to motor vehicles in Georgia, no, you do not. You can go down to the probate court clerks uh, and actually the, the tax commissioner's office with the original will and show them that this particular vehicle or at least all vehicles owned in the name of the of the deceased was supposed to go to this particular person and and they will let you uh, retitle the, the vehicle that way you don't have to open up a, a probate proceeding pay the you know two hundred dollars or so um sixty dollars <coughs> plus uh, a per page copy of the will it's going to be somewhere between $160 and $200 to file that probate proceeding, but you don't have to do that just to, if you're just retitling the vehicle. Um, so uh, have all those, uh, have all those together, you know, ties to the, to the RV, to any trailers. Um, I guess, I, guess uh, I don't own a golf cart and, and never have, so I'm not sure if uh, there's really a, a vehicle tied to the golf cart. Serial number, right? That kind of thing. Okay. Um, stock certificates, savings bonds, and brokerage accounts have all of that uh, information compiled and together. Um, uh, if, if that's uh, some of the assets that you own, uh, again, so, and, and <clears throat> getting back to things like revocable trusts, revocable trusts, uh, like wills, you don't want to necessarily transfer ownership of like brokerage accounts and financial accounts into ownership uh, by yourself as trustee of your trust. You don't want to do that. Uh, it doesn't. It's not necessary. Those those account anything that would not have to go through probate. You don't want to put into a revocable trust. Um, you can, but you don't have to. It's my. It's just my, my recommended practice that you not necessarily put it into the trust. I mean, you only want to put into the trust things that would have to get retitled through probate using a will. And so when it comes to things like uh, IRAs and 401k accounts, and bank accounts, those are going to pass via the contractual documents that you uh, sign when you set up the account. And that means they pass outside of probate. So, um, I just want to get back and make that distinction. I'm not sure I've done that before. For those of us and those of you who are still, you know, partners uh, or perhaps uh, members of uh, limited liability companies, uh, that sort of thing, maybe you're the, 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 the shareholder of, a, of an operating company, you want to have together for your survivors and all your partnership and any corporate operating agreements so that, um, uh, your, your loved ones know what is uh, needed, what what your rights, and what the rights of succession under those agreements may be. Um, it, that's a, that's a prime time for <coughs> disagreements to to break out. Uh, if you don't have the the operating agreements and the partnership agreements available for 
for actually to uh, take advantage of, of the situation and the only thing that's going to protect the survivors are these uh, uh, corporate operating agreements and the partnership agreements. Uh, tax returns, so I have your, your tax returns uh, for the last uh, you know, several years uh, available, especially in case that anything is necessarily necessarily need to, to prove or establish anything to the IRS. Um, as far as tax returns go, at least for 2013, really now let's talk about 2014, nobody has a federal tax estate problem unless your estate is worth $5.34 million. So uh, uh, unless unless you got an estate that's going to be uh, that, that size, pardon, or ten and a half, actually ten and a half with a with a married couple, each one is entitled to the five point three four million. Um, you, you don't really have a problem. Georgia does not have a uh, an estate tax. Uh, it's south. There's I think now there's only about uh, six states that do have an estate tax. But anyway, have all your your tax returns available uh, in case your survivors would, would need to access them. Uh, life insurance policies. Um, uh, and life insurance policies, while they are used to calculate the size of your estate for estate tax purposes, but uh, they, they operate outside of probate, so they pass according to the contractual terms of the policy. And, and when we're talking about a life insurance policy, we're also talking about the beneficiary designation forms. Uh, each one of your financial accounts and life insurance policies, uh, annuity contracts, will have beneficiary designation forms. And that's how your survivors are going to be authorized to access and receive those funds. So do them a favor and get copies of those beneficiary designation forms in advance. Keep them together with all your other uh, important estate related documents, your wills, your trusts, things like that. So there's no question about who is and who is not a, a beneficiary designated to, to receive the, the funds in that account. Um, that's what I meant, uh, the individual retirement account, um, the 401 k to the extent anybody still has a 401 k and has it converted to uh, some other sort of financial vehicle like a like an IRA, those are all going to be uh, governed by the terms of the, of the contract, the contractual provisions of the account, and the beneficiary designation forms. Um, and then, you know, any pension documents uh, for those of you who are fortunate enough to, to have a pension, uh, supplementing your estate plan, have your pension documents. Um, same thing with annuity contracts. Uh, have all that stuff together and available so that there's no question about what's what's there, uh, who's entitled to it, where you go to uh, contact the, the administrator of, of those accounts, and, uh, and, and basically uh, be, be in a position to either liquidate or, or pass, uh, pass those on. Uh, same thing for bank accounts. And the, and the one thing I did want to spend a little bit of time on is uh, something that's, uh, that's new to, to all of us, uh, at least since about 1995, and that's, uh, you know, if you do any appreciable amount of business online, you really need to spend some time uh, preparing, updating, maintaining a, a list of any accounts, including the, you know, URL, the, the addresses, uh, the internet addresses uh, for accounts that you do access online, uh, whether it's you know, utility bills, you, you maybe pay you know, any utility or credit card bills or other accounts you pay online, uh, down to things like Facebook and Google. Um, you, that, it, it's just something that you need to give a lot of thought, I think you ought to give a lot of thought to, and essentially you ought to, you know, designate uh, somebody as your digital executor, if it's not the 
same person you're using as executor of your will, um, maybe uh, somebody else who you're going to give a list of all your usernames and passwords to access every account, uh, as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, internet address, the, the URL, uh, to, to uh, get to those accounts. And uh, I guess I'll say that you ought to keep that list as, as confidential as you as you necessarily would any of your other financial documents. Obviously, a lot of harm can be done if, if, uh, if that list, uh, you know, what fell into the wrong hands, and, and you're exposing yourself to identity theft and, and that sort of thing. But it, it really is worth, uh, I think, uh, putting together a list that your survivors can then access using your use, username and, and password to take, can continue to take care of business uh, after you pass away. Um, uh, a list of, if you've got more, obviously more than one, and access to safe deposit boxes. Again, this is something like uh, having a trusted individual person who's going to serve as executor of your state or you know, an adult child, having them, giving them uh, sign permission to access your, your safe deposit box um, if, if you have one at a bank, that, that kind of a thing, uh, and, and a key to it if that's the way you access it. Um, you know, I've gotten a debate at a will sign with, with a nice lady uh, last night about whether you ought to keep your will and trust in the safe deposit box or not. And, and uh, it's frankly uh, my thought that it's, it's a lot easier to, to have, it, have it available at the house. Uh, I, I know it's a, a bit of a risk by uh, having it at the house and not in a safe deposit box. Perhaps you have to drive five or six miles to, to, to go get it, that sort of thing. Just, I think the there's there's minimal or there's more inconvenience to requiring somebody to sign and be on the safe deposit account and ha have the key, know where the key is, that sort of thing, than to simply uh, have your will or trust documents available at your house and just tell them where where, where it is. By the way, if anybody's interested, uh, I invested. You know, several thousand dollars in a in a 650 pound safe, fireproof safe. It's in it's in my house, and, I, and I'll maintain and keep safe any documents that uh, anybody wants to uh, keep there. Now, there is only one key to the doggone thing. Well, there's two actually. But there's only one one key uh, available, and they may and you, you, your ability to access your account, your documents if they're in my safe, um, may. Be determined by whether I'm you know, there in the house and in my office or not. But anybody who would like to um, and, and avoid any you know, rental expenses at a, at a bank, you're welcome to keep your, your uh, documents that you want to be sure are kept safe uh, uh, in my safe. Um, it's, it's useful to, to keep. Uh, your personal and family medical history available. This is I obviously goes more towards uh, not just you know a, a family legacy, but you know for for doctors who may be taking care of you and uh, in, in your final days that haven't previously you know, had any um, had any history with you. So uh, to the extent <coughs> that you can reconstruct, compile, and keep together uh, your your personal medical history, especially for the past few years and since the onset of any particular uh, conditions, that's that's what you ought to do is, is have all these documents together. Um, a marriage license. Uh, some people say, why, why do you need a marriage license? I haven't seen that doggone thing, you know, in, in 40, 47 years, um, you know, about the second day after uh, me and they really got married. Well, you're going to actually need to to produce that to Social Security when you if, if you're if you're the survivor, if your spouse has passed away, you're entitled to 
uh, access any Social Security uh, benefits. You actually, that's one of the documents they're going to ask you for besides the death, death certificate. So if you have that uh, available, uh, at least if or a certified copy of it, you're going to be doing your survivor uh, a favor. And uh, hey, I mean, you might even you might even use it uh, to uh, to uh, access uh, Social Security benefits of a spouse you were divorced from. Uh, uh, if you're married to that spouse for more than 10 years, uh, there, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge expert on Social Security. I need to be more uh, knowledgeable about it than I am. But uh, that is, there are survival benefits uh, available to uh, the divorced spouses of, uh, of, of individuals uh, as long as you were married to for, for 10 years. So anyway, having those, those kind of documents available you may, may feed to your financial benefit. And then finally, uh, divorce decrees and other legal proceedings that you might have been involved in, like a property tax appeal. <laughs> uh, you might, you might uh, have all of your, you should have all of those documents uh, together as well. And, uh, and, and, and know actually what's, what's out there. Uh, I'll use the example of the young couple I met with today. Uh, it was, was kind of interesting. Um, this the, the fellow who, who passed away at, at 65, he must have been, been quite a character because uh, he, well, he unfortunately was, was injured in a work-related accident. He got a fairly large settlement. He was unable to work, and so he spent the last you know, years of his life pretty much just living it up. He ran a bunch of credit card debt while while his he was waiting for his case to settle, but he did get a very nice you know, mid to high six figure settlement. So he decided to live on that and to not pay back those credit cards and to um, uh, basically just uh, take it easy and and uh, uh, play cards and watch movies at night and and live off of off of his. Uh, had a large settlement. Well, he wound up getting uh, a number of lawsuits filed against him. And then, uh, since he didn't hire a lawyer and contest them, and that's probably wise because it wasn't any contest, uh, he uh, had judgment taken against him. And then pretty soon, those judgment creditors found out where some of his accounts were, and they started garnishing those accounts. And so he lost a lot of money that way, just uh, uh, via garnishments. Which were uh, were high, were jacked up to much larger amounts than what he probably could settle for had he simply communicated with the, with the creditors. But uh, some of them got paid, some of them didn't get paid. And what that what this wound up doing was putting this this uh, nice young uh, army sergeant, uh, his his son, in a position where he had a house, and the house should have been paid off with. Because it, it, it was worth less than, than about seventy-five thousand dollars, but he still had a mortgage on it. But he had some equity in it, and the son was hoping he could uh, fix the house up a little bit. He's going to have to put in some money and fix it up and sell it, uh, and, and uh, you know, after he paid off the mortgage, perhaps you know, clear about maybe thirty thousand dollars or something like that. But when when he pulled out all the debt documents and the lawsuits that his dad had been involved in. And I saw where the judgments had already been taken. Well, those judgments have already been recorded. And so after the bank gets paid, then the judgments are going to have to get paid. And this guy, is, 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 unfortunately, this, this young uh, young man is not going to have any equity at all. And and so, you know, I was basically in the position of telling him, I, I really don't think I can help you. I don't think any lawyer can help you because all you're going to be doing is paying me to go start a probate proceeding. Again, if you remember my story from earlier, he died without a will, so now he has to go through probate to pass title to to anybody, including himself, through the probate process. And all you're going to be doing is uh, spending money to probate uh, a, a will that the only real asset is this house. You're not going to get anything out of it because the judgment creditors who already have liens have, uh, are going to have to get paid first. And uh, so it, it was a very unfortunate situation, obviously. But um, 
if you are involved in, in sort of uh, legal proceedings, uh, then uh, or we're saying the benefit from, from, from them, you ought to have those, those papers uh, together as well. And, and even divorce securities from you know, perhaps uh, past marriages, they ought to be available so that there's no question about you know who was married to whom and, and when. Um, and you know, maybe that's something you don't necessarily uh, advertise or go into too terrible amount of detail like I don't with, with my uh, adult children, but at the same time, uh, they are essential essential documents that uh, will be useful or may be useful in terms of uh, determining who has what rights to, to what assets depending on when uh, the, the marriage began and when the marriage ended. So are there any, any additional questions I can answer? Okay, just before we press, excuse me, just for a moment. I should have said this at the beginning of the program. We only have one working microphone in the Minute Center. This is it. <laughs> and the, uh, the presentation is being recorded. So when you ask your questions, Don's going to hold on to the microphone, but please ask loud enough so it can be recorded and everybody else can hear what the question is. Thank you very much. We'll allow for about, I would say, 15 minutes of questions, and then I'll, I'll close shop. Okay, thanks, Bruce. And then I'll repeat the question, too. That's right, we need to be mindful of the camera. Go, go ahead. Is there a need for a birth certificate? Is there a need for a birth certificate? Yeah. That's, that's, that's useful to, to, to establish citizenship. Um, I, but in terms of, um, Actually, accessing financial documents and so forth, that, that just seems to give me my list. Rudy? It's actually not a question, but a comment to just sort of emphasize something that you sort of touched on, but didn't really stay specific. You have 23 kinds of documents and items here, and if a lot of people might be like my wife and I, we have these in 23 different places. I have some things in the back of the sock drawer, and some things are in the same. or the list of bank accounts or the, the, the list of digital uh, account uh, and access information. Have everything written down and have it in one place. And, and do be mindful of the situation, uh, which, which unfortunately is, uh, occurs more often than we might realize, that the common accidents and common in, in spouses do, to, do die in common disasters and more then just one person needs to know where your uh, information can be found, where it can be accessed, and where in the house they can find your or the safe box, box or whatever. But, but, but do inform uh, some additional third person about, uh, about where they can be found. You suggested that it might be a good idea to put the survivor signature on your so they can, they can use your access your checking. Yes. And if you do that, I mean, that person should get sued mm -hmm. if you're checking the account. No, no, if you don't want to put them in, uh, in, in the title to the account. You don't want to make <laughs> this a joint account. Right. <coughs> but just giving them check signing authority does not okay. make them, does, does not uh, expose your account to risk okay. for, for their debts. Yeah, Jeff. Like, what if your view on, if you have a replicable, replicable trust, <coughs> whether you might want to introduce the, uh, a, uh, uh, a disclaimer trust into your documents or even consider dismantling the trust. Um, the, the 
question is, and this is getting getting a little bit uh, more. The, the question relates to a disclaimer trust, uh, in addition to or complementing, uh, supplementing the the revocable trust, um, or uh, given that there may not be any tax benefits to having <coughs> assets held in the trust. Should thought be given to dismantling the, the trust all the revocable trust altogether. My my advice, my opinion, is that because the revocable trust still serves a primary and principal benefit of avoiding probate and allowing assets to be dealt with seamlessly after the death, let's say it's a couple that holds all, all their uh, property jointly as co-trustees of a revocable trust, okay? You're, you're both co-trustees, so the first the spouse passes away, the second one just continues on as trustee of all that trust property uh, without having to go through any sort of probate. I think that is a, is a huge benefit personally. Uh, instead of having to, particularly at a stressful time in, your, in, in the survivor's life, mess around with with uh, you know, things that would otherwise have to go through the probate. Now, we, those of us who, uh, you know, aren't, aren't single, those of us uh, who uh, were conveyed a, a house out here by Pulte, uh, typically the, the Pulte deed was uh, con conveyed the property to you with, as joint tenants with Ryder survivors, which, which serves the, the same and has the same legal effect as if you held the, the property in a revocable trust. Um, that is, one of you die, dies, the, the, the survivor simply carries on, owns the house until you know, the second to die, the, the second spouse passes away. Um, the revocable trust can do essentially the same thing, but it does take care of the situation of, uh, like, like both of you pass away in a kind of disaster, okay? Or, situation, again, a young lady I was uh, I've been assisting who, whose parents died within a short amount of time after each other. Uh, before they could probate dad's estate, um, mom died about six months later. They got around to probate the, the father's estate. I'm actually helping her probate both estates at the same time. It was a mess. And she was kind of like, why didn't anybody tell me about a trust? Because everything would just seamlessly carried on. There wouldn't have been any probate needed. She would have been the successor trustee because she was named as the executor uh, in, in, in both wills. And uh, uh, she wouldn't have had to, to go through any hassle of, of, of probate. So that's that, that's my thought on, in terms of dismantling the revenue <coughs> trust on I, I guess I'd have to look more at the in terms of using a disclaimer trust, um, whether that would, uh, the, the pros and cons of that in line of you know, current tax law. Uh, other questions? I yes. have a suggestion. In the loss of a spouse, you need a minimum of 20 death certificates because so many, everywhere you turn, someone needs a copy. That's Your true. Banks, um, so uh, 20 minimum. And you can typically get those at the funeral. Right? Why? Generally, they'll make as many as you want. Generally, they will. There's a charge. What's, what's the, what would be the advantage of taking the stocks and other financial papers that you said hold separately and making the trust the beneficiary? So that all that property and the monetary value would move to the trust where it would be distributed. Well, again, because, because there's not really much in way of uh, tax considerations anymore uh, with the federal state tax being <coughs> the, the limit so high. Um, uh, the stock certificates would necessarily need to go through probate. Um, and so I'm really, we're talking about in terms of a revocable trust, just things that would have to be retitled going through probate. So um, I, I would uh, I, I would recommend, and most, most, most people don't, uh, uh, at least as far as those I've been, don't own stock certificates themselves. It's held in a, in a brokerage account, and the account contract document.
governments are, are always going to govern in terms of you know, beneficiary designations, that kind of thing. Other questions? Okay, well, if I can be of uh, any assistance, I'm, I'm in, the, in the directory and I'd be happy to do as much as I possibly can uh, as inexpensively as possible. Thank you very much.